I think it is clear to believe in the power of ideas. Fresh, thank you for the Manhattan Institute. Good afternoon. On behalf of the Manhattan Institute and our Center for State and Local Leadership, welcome to the annual presentation of the Institute's Urban Innovator Award. I'm Howard Husick. I'm Vice President for Policy Research at the Manhattan Institute, and it's a privilege for us to present our Innovator Award this year to the former Chancellor of the District of Columbia Public School System, Michelle Rhee. This nonpartisan award is just one of the many programs of the Institute's Center for State and Local Leadership, which is dedicated to the belief that state and local governments truly remain the laboratories of American democracy, where both elected and appointed officials can and do lead the way toward effective reforms. Past winners of the award include Chicago Mayor Richard Daley, Indiana Governor Mitch Daniels, Atlanta Public Housing Authority Director Rene Glover, and Los Angeles and former New York Police Commissioner William Bratton. The approaches of these urban innovators don't fit a preconceived ideological notion of how government should operate. Instead, we are recognizing exceptional officials who have shown what works and hope that that recognition will help spread the word about what they've accomplished. With that in mind, our Center for State and Local Leadership just this week has inaugurated its latest project, a website called Public Sector Inc., which highlights both the special financial challenges which face state and local government today and constructive reforms both proposed and already taken. Our topic this morning, however, is public education. And to introduce our 2011 urban innovator, it's my pleasure to introduce someone deeply versed and experienced in public education here in New York, Frank Macchiarola. In his distinguished career, Dr. Macchiarola, a native of the Flatbush section of Brooklyn, has served in a series of key public roles here in New York, including most recently as president of St. Francis College, as chair of the New York City Charter Revision Commission, as a member of the New York State Commission on Education Reform, and most important for our purposes today, from 1978 through 1983, as chancellor of the New York City Public Schools. To introduce Michelle Rhee, please join me in welcoming Frank Macchiarola. Thank you very much, Howard. Uh, the appointment of a new school's chancellor in New York City came at about the same time as Michelle Rhee's leaving as Chancellor of the District of Columbia Public Schools. The loss of Michelle Rhee's service to the children of the district came with universal regret. In fact, while most enterprises, in most enterprises, leaders are replaced because of their lack of success, our speaker today was encouraged to resign her position precisely because of her considerable successes. Success which placed her in a lonely place of distinguished school system leaders. The list of her successes as head of the DC public schools is impressive. Closing non-performing schools, cutting central administration staff by half to support the classroom, leading DC schools from last place to first in national assessment scores for reading and math in fourth and eighth grades, increasing enrollment in schools and increasing greater choice for DC parents so that there is an increase in the number of students in attendance this for the first time in four decades. 
Her agenda has always been clear. Student success comes first. And obstacles to student, student success, whether entrenched collective bargaining benefits that stand in the way, or administrators who fail their students, these cannot be tolerated. Michelle Ree believes all children of all backgrounds can learn, and her many successes, beginning as a teacher for America Corps in Baltimore, right to her chancellorship at the New York at the nation's capital, proves it. She founded in 1997 and was chief executive officer and president of the New Teacher Project. As chief executive and officer and president, she partnered with school districts, state educational agencies, nonprofit organizations, and unions to transform the way schools and other organizations recruit, select, and train highly qualified teachers in difficult to staff schools. Her improvements have been taken place in Atlanta, Baltimore, Chicago, Miami, New York, Cleveland, and Philadelphia. TNTP placed 23,000 new highly qualified teachers in these schools across the country. In, in June 2007, Major in, Mayor Adrian Fenty appointed her to head the floundering DC public school system a system of 123 schools and 47,000 students. Under her leadership, the, the worst performing urban school district in the country became the only major city system to see double digit growth in their, in their state reading and state math scores in seventh, eighth, and ninth grades over three years. In her first year as chancellor, every eligible DC public school attracted applicants in her last year as chancellor. Every eligible DC public school attracted applicants for the annual K-12 out-of-boundary preschool and pre-kindergarten lotteries. 14 schools had waiting lists for the first time. And ultimately, a record high of 5,129 families representing an increase of 50% over less than a decade expressed interest in DC public school programs located in every one of the eight wards in the district. The defeat of Mayor Fenty in November ended all of that. For 18 years, Michelle Ree has been at the forefront of student success and now leaves for a new mission as founder and CEO of Students First. She has earned our respect, and for that she has received the Manhattan Institute's Urban Innovator Award, and she deserves our support as she engages on a mission that is the only hope to secure our democracy, educating and preparing youngsters for what is theirs to come. Michelle Reed. Thank you. I will say that I feel like a bit of a sham because when I look at this, the Urban Innovator Award, it makes you think that uh, I am somebody who has figured something out. Um, I have not figured out the answer uh, yet uh, of how we are going to turn around this nation's schools, um, but I have figured out a whole lot of things that don't work. Um, so let me just give you a little, little bit of background. When I graduated from college, I graduated from Cornell University in 1992, and I, I joined the Teach for America program, was placed in an inner city school in Baltimore, Maryland, one of the lowest performing, uh, highest poverty schools in the city. Uh, I uh, taught there for three years in my second and third year looped with a group of kids, which means I, I, I had them for two years. I team taught with another teacher. Anyways, we, we took this group of kids who were scoring at the absolute bottom on standardized tests and within a two-year period moved them to the absolute top. 
and uh, through that experience, um, you know, saw that it was not the the, the children's home lives because their parent, who their parents were, didn't change their their diets and what they were eating, the violence in the community. What the only thing that changed were the adults who were in front of them every single day, the expectations that we had in them, and the work ethic that we instilled, and that was what made the difference. So my idea coming out of that experience was that if we were going to change the face of public education in this country, that it was all about recruiting the right people to become teachers. So I started the, a national organization called the New Teacher Project. And at the time, in 1997, the common wisdom was that if we could just recruit the best and the brightest to come into education, well, that would solve all of our problems. And the US Department of Education came out with a statistic saying that we were going to need 2 million new teachers over the next 10 years. So that's where my focus was. And after uh, starting the organization and starting some of the most successful alternate route programs across the country, like the New York City Teaching Fellows and the Massachusetts State Signing Bonus Program, what we quickly realized was that this was not a recruitment problem. That in fact, in every city that we went into, we could find plenty of people who wanted to change careers and come into education. So it wasn't, it wasn't a problem of inspiring great people to want to come into education. The problem was that they actually couldn't get hired by the school system because of an incredibly dysfunctional HR system. So we shifted our focus from recruitment to then working with these HR departments. And we, 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 uh, we documented all of the barriers that existed in these HR departments, all of the rules, all the regulations, all the time frames. Uh, and, and we thought, okay, if we can, if we can solve this problem, then, then we're in good shape. And uh, so after doing that work for a few years, we, I also quickly came to realize that that is not the main issue because we created these great HR departments, but they, they couldn't operate as islands of excellence within a sea of dysfunction within the, re the, the, the rest of the school system because the school system overall was making these ridiculous decisions that then negatively impacted whether or not HR could uh, to, could could uh, do their job in a timely and effective manner. Um, so about the time that I came to that um, that realization, uh, I was um, introduced to uh, Mayor Adrian Fenty of D.C., and he had just won control of the Washington, D.C. public schools and uh, was the only person in the country who thought that it might be a good idea for him to hire me to run the schools. So uh, I thought to myself, okay, here, here's, here's the answer now. It's not just about recruitment. It's just, not just about HR. It's about fixing an entire district. And what better opportunity than to go into the lowest performing, most dysfunctional school district? Because if we can fix that, then it would put all of the naysayers to, to, to bed. Um, people would uh, you know, see that, that progress was possible, and they would want it to continue. So I sort of went into this, and what I realized is that that really wasn't it either, right? Because what we did in D.C. in a very short period of time is take the, this incredibly dysfunctional environment and make it functional. Um, uh, like the chancellor said, we, we, we managed to take what was the, at the time, the lowest performing school district in the country, where we were last on the NAEP examination, which is the national exam. Um, within a two-year time period, we actually led the nation in gains in both reading and math at both the fourth and eighth grade level. We were the only jurisdiction in which every single subgroup of children was progressing academically. And um, you know the, the idea that when people saw the results that they would want more of it was absolutely wrong. <laughs> so my, my new revelation <laughs> is that we were playing the wrong game. Right? I would spend my time, as many reform, education reformers across the country do, uh, which is talking to politicians and trying to appeal to their sense of what is good and right for children. And meanwhile, you've got the interest groups like the teachers union funding their campaigns. So at the end of the day, are you going to go with the, the nice little lady over here who says you can do good for kids, or are you going to go with the people who are going to get you reelected? This is an easy choice that people make. <laughs> So I uh, have now decided, um, and I, so don't, don't be surprised if I come back three years from now and say I was wrong again, but, but, my, but my latest um, uh, 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 position on this is that we, we have been playing the wrong game to date and that we have to start playing the right game. 
And what that means is essentially that I believe for the last three decades in this country, as the U.S. has fallen further and further behind, part of the reason why that's happened is because the educational agenda in this country has been driven by special interests. And so you have folks with millions of dollars and millions of people who are getting the politicians that they want elected and the laws that they want passed and the laws that they don't want blocked. And the biggest issue is that there is no organized interest group who is advocating on behalf of children in this equation. So you, you end up with a lopsided landscape and lopsided policies. And so what we need is a national organization that has the heft, the national heft, to actually bring some balance to the equation. So I have started Students First. It is a, it is a membership in an organization, but a national movement. Uh, that will uh, defend and promote the best interests of children and that will uh, pursue an aggressive agenda of reform that will make America's schools number one in the world again. So people say, oh, that's nice, but what are you actually going to do, right? So let me give you one example of the kind of issue that we would take on with students first. Uh, one of the, the, the things that I think uh, people underestimate is the power of quality educators in our schools. And uh, all of the data bears this out, is that if you have a great teacher, it can make all of the difference for kids. But all of the policies that exist right now actually conspire against our children having the best educators in the classroom. So one specific example of this, um, and it's an issue that is particularly relevant today in this time of, of contracting budgets, is how we lay teachers off in school districts. So the way that we do it in public school districts today, if you have a budget crisis, you have to lay a teacher off or a group of teachers off, we do it by seniority. Last in, first out. So the LA Times, and I was just in LA yesterday, uh, interestingly did this uh, study because they have all this value added student achievement data. They know all of the teachers who are the most effective and least effective in the district. And basically they wrote a, they wrote a story about two weeks ago. Uh, and in the story, it, it highlights one middle school in particular, which was one of the, 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 the worst middle schools in LA. And they, they decided to uh, do a massive turnaround at the school. So they brought in a brand new principal who brought in a brand new staff of people, some of them veteran teachers, some of them you know, brand new rookie teachers. And over a two year time period, they uh, you know, took this school from, from being at the absolute bottom to again, leading, leading the district in gains in math. Uh, they saw a tremendous amount of momentum, but what happened was when the district had to conduct layoffs, this school uh, suffered a significant layoffs. <clears throat> so uh, because they had seen so much success, they didn't want that success to end. They sort of went public about this, and the first thing the teachers did is they went to the teachers' union, and they said, what can you do to, to, to stop this phenomenon from happening? We, we don't want to lose our jobs. We can't lose the momentum of the school. And the teachers' union said to them, well, Here's the problem. We think that seniority-based layoffs are the only fair way to, to do this. So if you have been in the system longer, you get more rights and privileges, which if you are looking at it from the adult perspective and the union perspective, that's absolutely right. The problem is that when you look at it from the children's perspective, the student's perspective, what they found was that by laying teachers off by seniority, they were actually firing lots and lots of teachers who were the most effective teachers in the district. And in fact, in this particular school, a significant portion of the teachers who were laid off fell into the top 20% of middle school teachers in the city. So someone explain to me how that's good for kids, right? The second uh, a phenomena that happened was that because they laid teachers off by seniority, which means that they laid off the newest teachers who also happened to be the cheapest teachers, they actually had to lay more people off to fill the budget hole, right? The, the analysis showed that had they laid people off by quality instead of seniority, many, many fewer jobs would have been lost because it would have allowed them to remove some ineffective veteran teachers. So again, from the adult perspective, the money is the money, it's all the same thing, the amount of money that you cut. But from the children's perspective, if more classrooms are losing their teachers, it is not beneficial for the children. 
The last um, is that uh, when budget cuts like this come down, you have system-wide layoffs by seniority. The higher performing schools in the more affluent parts of town actually have more stable staffs. Their staffs have been there for a long time because it's a great place to work. So those folks are basically untouched by the budget cuts. And meanwhile, schools like the one that was highlighted in the Times and other struggling schools who see massive teacher turnover every year, they're decimated by the budget cuts. So you have a differential impact on the kids who actually need the help the most. All of those, all of those uh, 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 consequences of this policy, again, which is fine for the adults, have negative impacts on kids. So that is exactly the kind of policy that we will take on as students first. We will take it on at the district level, at the state level, at the national, wherever we need to play in order to change laws uh, and regulations and policies that do not benefit and put children at the forefront. Uh, you know, in this, um, I, am, I am not a, a stranger to, to controversy. And uh, when I, when I uh, announced that I was going to start Students First, and uh, I don't know if you saw the cover of Newsweek last week, but you know, the sort of tagline was, I'm not done fighting. And um, you know, immediately we sort of got lots of reactions from people saying, there she goes again, she's so belligerent, you know, and we wish she would just uh, cooperate a little more and, and have a, a collaborative spirit about her. So I actually feel like this is something that is worth talking about. When I was uh, in DC as the chancellor, um, I went about a year into my tenure there, I went and gave a speech at a conference actually here in New York and a very high ranking official from the Democratic Party came up to me afterwards and said, Michelle, I have some unsolicited advice for you. And I said, okay, let her rip. And he said, you need to soften up. Soften, soften, soften. <laughs> and he said, because you are so hardcore all the time and you, you talk about the bad things that are going on and how bad the situation is and you tell people this data about only 8% of the kids are on grade level. And when you talk about bad things, it makes people feel bad. <laughs> and people don't want to feel bad, Michelle. People want to feel good. So if you would just soften up a little bit, you could get so many more people behind you. And I looked at him and I said, I totally disagree with you. I said, part of the problem in public education is we have been so busy talking about the good things and being unwilling to talk about, about the bad things that there's a sense of complacency. I said, so if by talking about the bad things, we make the adults feel uncomfortable, but at the same time, give them a sense of urgency about needing to take this seriously and significantly transform the system, then I am okay with that. About a year afterwards, uh, there was a Washington Post columnist who wrote a, who wrote a piece on me and he said, uh, I wish Michelle Rhee would be nicer. He said, I, I like her and I like the gains that we are seeing as a city. These decisions that she's making are, are, are long overdue, uh, but, but she, needs to, she needs to be a little nicer. And so I, I called him and I said, so what's this all about? And he said, well, I, I want you to stay around for a really long time. And I'm terrified that if you don't start being a little nicer to people, that you won't be here for very long. And I said, you know what, you need to decide what you think are the most important characteristics for a school's chancellor. And if you think friendly and collaborative and cooperative are the most important things, then you should actually be advocating for my ouster. Because if you want warm and fuzzy, I am not your girl. I said, however, I said, but if you like the results and you think they need to continue, then what you should be talking about in your column is not about how I should become nicer, but how we should as adults get over ourselves and our hurt feelings and this sort of thing, and actually just put our focus on the kids. And I say this because there is this opportunity right now in this country, I believe, where the general public is actually becoming more in tune to the problems in public education. There's more sunlight and sunshine on the insane practices that are happening. So we have a moment in time. And if our focus is how can we all hug and, 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 and collaborate on a solution, we are not going to move the ball forward, but this much.
right? So we cannot shy away from a little conflict and a little controversy. And I don't say this because I want to go around and poke people in the eye. I'm not, I'm not going to be belligerent and I'm not going to get in fights just for the sake of getting in a fight. But I, I, I also do not think that we can avoid controversy at all costs so that we as the adults can feel good about getting along with one another. And I think, you know, if, if you look at public education today, there, uh, people are very, very conflict averse. And it's because we don't want this tension to exist uh, that I think we've been doing a disservice to kids for many years. So let's get comfortable with a little fighting. Uh, there are two things that I think we should um, have some conversation and will undoubtedly have a lot of disagreements about. Uh, the first is this question around poverty and home environment versus what the school can do. In education reform, there are two very different camps. And one camp says that nothing that a school can do really can overcome what the parents will not do, what the home environment has created, et cetera. There's nothing that well-meaning people can do to overcome that. And the other camp says, yes, those, uh, those environmental factors are challenges, but if we're doing what we should for our kids, then the school environment can actually make a huge dent in overcoming those challenges. So I think the most important thing uh, to, to keep in mind as you have these debates is what kids actually say. So I have been asking kids this question for a very long time, and uh, I'm going to share with you two quick stories. The first is that um, about a year ago, I went uh, on an on a unannounced visit to one of the worst performing high schools in Washington, D.C., and I went in uh, in the morning, first thing in the morning, and I went from class to class to class. In the first class, there were three kids present. At the second class, there were nine. The third class, there were five. By the time I got to the fourth class and there were seven kids there, I thought, what on God's green earth is going on? So I asked the teacher, where are all the kids? She said, oh, it's Friday. I said, really? Is that the excuse? We're, 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 because it's Friday, we're okay with kids not coming to school? She said, no. And I said, okay, so what else? Well, thinking that she was going to give me, you know, the kids are on a field trip or something like that. She says, it's raining too. When we've gotten to the point where our expectations are such that we do not expect kids to come to a school because it's the last day of the week and we have inclement weather, we have lost our way, folks. So I'm walking from classroom to classroom. I'm finishing my tour. I actually walk into one classroom that is full to the brim of children. There are more than 30 kids in there. There aren't enough desks for all the kids. Half of them are sitting on the radiators. What's going on here? So I walk in. This teacher is teaching a really solid lesson. I talk to one of the kids, and I said, so tell me about the teacher. He said, this is my best teacher. Absolutely. I said, really, why? He said, Be two reasons. Because he teaches us something new every day, and when you don't, understand something, he will explain it to you. And I thought, my goodness, that is such a low bar for <laughs> who our favorite teacher is. So anyways, I watched the rest of the class, very, very solid teacher, and, and as I was walking out of the building, that young man and two of his friends were walking out of the building in front of me. So this is 10 o'clock in the morning. So wait a second, where are you going? He said, oh, well, the first period teacher, the one that you just saw, that's our best teacher, so we come to school for him. But our second period teacher is awful, so we're going to roll. <laughs> this is not the picture that American public has of truants, right? We think of the kids who are in bed until noon, and then they get up, and they're on the streets, and they're causing all kinds of problems. We are not thinking about children who are making the conscious decision to wake up early and come to school because the first period teacher is an excellent one, and then decide to leave after that because they're not going to get anything out of, out of that class, right? I mean, they're making decisions based on information about where their time is best spent, just like we do every day. So don't underestimate the kids. I was uh, last week at Democracy Prep, and I, I see uh, Seth Andrews here, who's the head of that school, up in Harlem, and I asked the kids the same question. This is a group of kids, all kids of color, uh, who come from very you know, uh, low-income backgrounds, et cetera, and I asked them the question. So a lot of people say, you can't learn. What do you think? They're giving me answers. First of all, all of them disagree. The one kid who has the most poignant answer, though, she said, you know what? At the end of the day, it doesn't matter where we're coming from so much as where we're going to every morning that will either make or break us. So the children are telling us 
that they can do it as long as we are doing our jobs. So I feel like we should follow suit. The, the second um, piece that, that I think we need to have a serious conversation about in this country is that I think that part of the real problem in America is that we have lost our competitive spirit. Completely lost our competitive spirit. It's, it's at every level at which we operate. So it starts with our children, okay? We want all of our kids to feel good. We want them all to have high self-esteem. So we've created this environment where we're so busy telling kids that, are, uh, that they're great that they all now think that they're great when they're not. And I'll, I'll use my own children as an example. I have two little girls, eight and 11. But they play soccer, because everybody in our neighborhood plays soccer. My kids suck at soccer, okay? <laughs> they take after their mother and the athletic abilities. But if you were to go into their bedrooms, you would see them adorned with trophies and medals and ribbons. You would think that I am raising the next Mia Hamm, but I am not. So I try to tell them all the time, you are not so good at soccer. In fact, you are bad. And now, if you practice a little harder, then you might be able to improve. I, can, I can't even guarantee that you'll ever be great, even if you practice really hard. But if we don't communicate that to our kids, and they all grow up thinking that they're the best when they're actually not, it creates a sense of complacency. They will never be able to compete with their, with their global, global counterparts. I can guarantee you, because as a Korean, I can tell you that in South Korea, starting from when children are in kindergarten, they get ranked, right, one through 40 in the class. You know exactly where you stand. That would be a, I mean, there would be a rebellion in America if we did that, right? <laughs> you are hurting my child's self-esteem and all this sort of stuff. But what it creates, and I'm, I'm not saying this is the best thing, but what it creates in, in, in Korea is a constant sense of wanting to do better. So they're not worried about Singapore and, 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 and China. And all. They're just competing within the country because the, the culture is such that you're always trying to do better. So it starts with our children. It moves up to where our teachers are, right? So when I came into the District of Columbia Public Schools, 8% of our eighth graders were on grade level in mathematics, 8%. But if you were to have looked at the performance evaluations of the adults in the system at the same time, you would have seen that 95% of our staff were being rated as doing an excellent job. How can you possibly have a system where all of the adults are running around thinking they're doing great work and what we're producing for kids is 8% success? That's insanity. You, 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 you can't run an effective organization like that. So, but again, it was about making everybody feel good. You are doing a good job. So part of what we actually have to do is begin to differentiate amongst teachers. There are some amazing teachers in this country. The work that they do is unbelievable. It's heroic, truly. And we have some not so good teachers in this country. But you t once you start talking about differentiation, who's great, who's not great, you get, all kinds, you get called all kinds of names, trust me. I've been called everyone in the group. You are anti-teacher, you are scapegoating us, you are a union, but all this sort of stuff. And what I find interesting is that this can, I mean, if you look at any other field, you, you don't get the same reaction, right? So the analogy that I was trying to use with a group of teachers the other day, I said, say, for example, after I had to leave my job as chancellor, I was looking around at all of my options, and uh, my, my, my fiance, uh, Kevin Johnson, who's the current mayor of Sacramento, used to play in the NBA. So say I said, you know what? That NBA life, that's a pretty good life. Dribble around a little bit, get paid a whole lot of money, get to travel. I am going to become a professional basketball player. <laughs> so I practice, and I, and I play my first game, and I stink. I, can't, I, I don't score any points, I can't defend, I can't do anything, and the owners decide to cut me immediately. I would go to them and say, you can't cut me from this team. I came to every practice. I shoot 100 free throws on my own time. Afterwards, I'm trying hard, you can't cut me. They would say, are you kidding me? You, you are making the team lose, and if you make the team lose, then you make us lose, and we have no room for that, so you've gotta go. 
then I, maybe I would go next to the players association and I'd say, I'm a player, you're, you're a players, help me out. They would say the same thing. They'd say, absolutely not. You are, having players like you who stink are, is bad for the league. We don't want you in our ranks because you are not good, <laughs> right? And then I might even go to my, my honey who is supposed to you know, help me out the most and say, baby, can you do something about this? And he also probably would look at me and say, I love you, don't take this personally, but you are no good at basketball. <laughs> this doesn't mean you're not a good person, we just need to find a job for you that you're good at and that you will add value to, right? Nothing personal. Everyone in this room would think that is very, very reasonable, a very reasonable set of events. So we have to be able to take that reason and that rationale to the teaching profession as well. Being a great teacher is not an easy thing. It's not everyone is cut out for it, and not everyone is going to be great at it. But when we identify the people who are not good, we ought to be able to tell them that this is not the profession with that, for them without seeing it as an indictment on the entire profession or as them as individual people. Right? We've got to be able to break that up a little bit. The next level up is at the school level. The bottom line for me is that we still, despite the fact that we've got a, a, you know, a few little voucher and, and charter programs here and there, we still have public education as a government-run monopoly in this country. And I do not think that a government-run monopoly can produce a high quality product. We have to think about how we open up the marketplace, how we bring competition in, and we ensure that, that being in an excellent school is not a matter of luck for children, which is what it is right now, but a matter of fact. And the only way that I think we can do that is to sort of break this monopoly up and think about bringing innovative solutions in. Uh, and the last is at the, at the highest level as a nation right now. I had the, uh, the interesting experience this summer of hearing the Prime Minister of Singapore speak. Now, if you want to talk about a country that is knocking it out of the park right now, right, their sovereign wealth is here. I mean, they're, they're doing a great job. It, it, it made me completely rethink a benevolent dictatorship. Um, but anyways, uh, what, was, what was the most interesting thing was that when he uh, talked about their plan, for being, Singapore's plan for being number one, their their, their, I'm sorry, their, their economic plan was rooted in education. They were gonna make their education system the best and they knew that then that would propel them to be number one in everything else. So education, the number one strategy in their economic plan. We don't think about education that way in this country. We see education as a social issue. So what happens to social issues in tough economic times? It gets swept aside, right? It gets all these budget cuts and whatnot. Until we realize that we are never going to regain our position in the global marketplace until we fix our education system in this country, we'll, we will continue to fall further and further behind. My last thought is this, just this as a close. I, I believe that public education is supposed to be the great equalizer in our country. It is supposed to be the thing that ensures that it doesn't matter if you are black or white, rich or poor. We have a public education system so that every single child can have an equal shot in life, right? If you work hard and you do the right thing, you can live the American dream. That is not the reality that our children in America face today. The reality that our children face today is that if you live in, in Anacostia versus if you live in Georgetown in Washington, D.C., you get two wildly different educational experiences. It is the biggest social injustice imaginable because what it means is that we are still in this day and age, in this day and age, we are still allowing the color of a child's skin and the zip code that they live in to dictate their educational attainment levels and therefore their life chances and their life outcomes. It goes against everything we believe in as a country, and it has to stop. That is what Students First is going to do. So I hope that you will uh, consider joining the ranks because we, part of what we want to do is show that there is a groundswell of support for putting the children's interests before anyone else. I uh, announced Students First last week, last Monday, on uh, the Oprah Winfrey Show. And, uh, 
uh, I announced that we were going to raise $1 billion for the effort, and we were going to have 1 million members within the first year. And people thought I was insane. Within the four, first 48 hours of Oprah airing, we had over 100,000 members signed up. We were 10% of the way to our goal within 48 hours. We have over $700,000 in contributions through the website through small everyday donations. The average donation was $63. There, I believe that we've tapped into a latent desire in America to actually make our American schools the best again. People are ready to mobilize around this, and so we need the heft of numbers. We need all of you in this room. We need all of your friends to join this effort to show that the American people are willing to put children first. Thank you. Chancellor Rhee has, has agreed to accept some questions. If I might, uh, there's a discussion this week in New York about teacher tenure and how one should qualify for it. That was a big part of the uh, cutting edge contract that you negotiated in Washington, DC. What do you think about it? Should there even be tenure? Well, um, again, so the, the perspective of my new organization, Students First, is that we're gonna come at all of these policy issues from the vantage point of the child. So very student-centric approach. Tenure is a policy that protects adults, that sets a, a you know, sort of criteria for when an adult can, can lose a job and when they are guaranteed a job and all this sort of stuff. I actually believe that if protections are going to be afforded to anyone in public education, it should be children and only children. So, what that means is that if there is a possibility or a probability that a child could be in a position where they might have an ineffective teacher, that we've got to err on the side of protecting the child, not the job or the adult. So in other words, no, I don't think that, ten I think that tenure at the end of the day is a policy that does not benefit children. There is, there is no evidence that shows that there is any link between teacher tenure and student achievement levels. Uh, yes, if you, if you wait for the microphone, and if you don't mind identifying yourself, that'd be great. Hi, my name is Maureen Sullivan, and I'm a m member of the Hoboken, New Jersey School Board. And I have to say, I'm, it's, uh, there are nine members on the board. I'm the one, it's usually eight to one, I'm the one stirring up the controversy, and the big way to stir up controversy on our school board is to mention the name Michelle Ree, <laughs> as I do. <laughs> And there's lots of eye rolling and uh, guffawing. Um, so I'm wondering. It's nice to know that I, I invoke the gag. Yes, um, yes, you do. <laughs> so do I. So, um, and I'm wondering when I ran for the school board, I ran by myself, didn't win. Then I joined up another group of reformers, and we were going to reform the school board. Of course, once you get on the school board, it's very hard to reform because you are co-opted by the system. I'm just wondering what your advice is to local school board people like myself and through Students First. There are 600 school boards in New Jersey. How do, how do you get through? Yeah. How do you, do you run candidates? What so do you do? I've, I've been in uh, this field of education reform for 20 years, and so I've seen my fair share of the business community or the mayor trying to run a slate of reform-minded candidates. And what I've found is that there's just something about when you become a school board member, you like lose your mind. So even the sanest people going in all of a sudden are making crazy uh, decisions, which is why um, you know one of the things that students first will advocate is, is about governance. Um, at the end of the day, for troubled school systems, um, that need significant transformation. I do not think that a school board structure can, can deliver that. I think you have to move towards mayoral control where there is one uh, point of accountability. Um, now, mayoral control in and of itself is not enough because I know plenty of crazy mayors around the country as well. So it's, not, it's, it's mayoral control plus 
a really reform-minded, courageous mayor who is willing to take this issue and put it at the forefront. Only that combination, I think, can result in really dramatic change in a short period of time. Um, you know, I talk to my colleagues across the country, and, and uh, those people who are working in school board structures tell me that they spend upwards of 50 to 60 percent of their time trying to manage their boards. You know, when, when I was in D.C., if I wanted to implement a new policy, I'd say, to, you know, I'd go to the mayor and I'd say, sir, this is what we want to do. And he'd say, great. And that was it. Done. I mean, it was the most efficient process ever. Um, and the work was hard. I and mean, there's enough work to do even with that kind of decision-making process. So I just think that as long as we're playing politics with seven or nine or 11 people, all who have different agendas and priorities, many of whom are using the school board as a stepping stone to the city council in the next, it's just really impossible to drive the kind of reforms that you need. Uh, yes, sir, in the back. Wait for the microphone. Hi, uh, my name is Rob Friedman. Um, could you tell me um, how are you going to use the funds to direct where you want to accomplish your, your goals? I would imagine it would be also for funding candidates that are pro-reform, just as an example. Yes. Um, so there will be two main uses of the dollars. The first will absolutely be for candidates for legislation that we believe are pushing the agenda in the right direction. Um, but the other part will be used for, um, at the local level. So, for example, if, uh, 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 what happened in D.C. Was, it was a very unusual situation, but it was very effective. So what happened was, um, I, when I came into office, uh, our, our union contract had just expired. So we went into negotiations right away. And what I said to the union was, look, we have no money. So, you know, don't expect anything if you're just talking about city dollars. But what I had managed to do was raise a fair amount of foundation dollars, external dollars, um, from a group of foundations who were willing to put the money on the table if and only if we actually signed a contract that got rid of tenure and seniority and lockstep pay. Uh, so for two and a half years, they tried to, to, to they thought they were going to be able to convince me, we will give you half the concessions for half the money. And I said, no, this is a take it or leave it deal. It's all or nothing. So what the external money did was actually provided me with the leverage that I needed to be able to get a, a radical contract signed. I never would have been able to do it if it was funded by our, our city dollars. So part of what we also want to do is utilize the dollars as leverage in local jurisdictions where there is some courage, where there is the will to change, to, to sort of put it on the table very clearly and say, if you're willing to adopt these things, we're willing to actually give you the dollars to, to implement. Yes, Michael. Mike, I'm Michael Myers, Executive Director of New York Civil Rights Coalition. You may count me as a member. All right. Uh, my you got to go sign up, though. <laughs> I will. I will. My question to you is how? Assuming that we cannot tear up the teachers' contracts and the, and the seniority systems, how do you evaluate teachers so that bad teachers are, 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 are evaluated as bad and good teachers are encouraged and, and promoted and stay in the schools? And how, without a parents' union, do you counter the impact of the teachers' union? And how do you protect chancellors like you, who worked for an innovative mayor, from being defeated uh, at the polls without a countervailing power on the part of parents who understand that kids and students should be first? So that, that is the purpose of Students First. It is to provide that balance, that heft on the other side. And, you know, Part of, of, of uh, the reason why we formed this organization was because of the experience that, that I had in D.C. So just as an example, I remember uh, after sitting through a particularly tough city council meeting, because I had just laid off some teachers by um, quality instead of seniority, and so you know there was a sort of firestorm in the city, and uh, I got pummeled at this council hearing, and I, I got a call from a parent in the, who sent their kid uh, to, to the D.C. public schools, who was a supporter of mine. She said, you know, I was sitting in my office all day long, and I had the TV on, and all I could, I was just praying to God that you had the strength to make it through that craziness, and that you also have the strength to persevere, and that you don't let these insane people drive you out of town. She said, and then I realized, even God can't do that. 
I mean, you know, the God only has but so much influence. I actually realized that I needed to help you. I can't just be sitting in my office hoping and praying that you, you know, that, 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 that you persevere. So uh, the part of the problem that we faced in D.C., though, was we were never able to activate, to mobilize the people who supported us. So I'm not saying that everybody supported me, but the people who didn't support me were very vocal, they were very organized, they were very mobilized. On the flip side, the people who supported me were mostly doing so from the comfort of their own home or in their office. So, so if you were an elected official in D.C., save, save Adrian Fenty, you, and you're you know, watching the city council hearings and you're seeing who's coming in to complain or who's picketing outside the office and that sort of thing, it was not the people who actually liked the reforms. So part of what Students First is going to do is actually go into cities where the right things are happening, where leaders are taking courageous stands, and mobilize and organize the people to say, you know what? There is a whole lot of support for what's going on, and we, you know, we've got people, we've got money. We're we are going to be a force in this as well. Yes, yes sir, right back there in the in front of the. In, yes, you. Hi, I'm Robert Pendizia with the uh, Core Knowledge Foundation. I was um, a uh, New York City teaching fellow, so I owe you my career. Great, uh, my second career. Um, on teacher quality, a little bit of pushback if I can. I taught for several years in the lowest performing school in the lowest performing district here in New York City. Um, my education school was uh, added no value, let's say, to my, uh, my classroom practice. My professional development was nil. Uh, I was using a reading and writing curriculum that was not what I would have used if I made the choice myself. My math curriculum was horrible. Um, how does that factor into your decision making when you evaluate me as a teacher? I mean, this is, this is a tough question, but so let me just um, break it down as, as, as easily as I can. The bottom line is that in education and in teaching, there is a mindset that is very different from almost any other profession out there. So if you talk about medicine, for example, right? If you are an open heart surgeon, there is a specific way, a pr procedure that should be done, right? There's a process. And every open heart surgeon is not out there saying, you know what, I'm gonna I'm figure out how to suture this thing up on my own because I, I want to be creative. I don't want anyone to confine me into that procedure. I'm gonna do my own thing, right? That, no, that's, that doesn't happen. There, there, there is data that shows that the likelihood of survival will be much higher if you do these things as opposed to those things. And we don't have the same thing in education. And there's this over sort of uh, valuation of uh, creativity and letting people sort of be their own person and make their own decisions. Well, that's essentially what we've had in this country for the last 30 years, and it hasn't produced a whole lot. And, not, and I'm not just talking about at the classroom level. I'm talking about also at the district level. So you were saying there are 600 school districts in New Jersey. Each school board is determining what curriculum they're going to use. Are they going to buy this math curriculum or that one? Instead of us as a country saying, here are the best practices. Here's what the research says works. This is what we're going to do. That doesn't, that doesn't demean you as a professional. It doesn't turn you into a, a robot who doesn't get to think on their own. This is just what works. And we have to do what works, not what doesn't work. Right, one last question. Peter. You it came out, sorry, Peter Flanagan. You came out publicly in favor of the voucher program in Washington, which the administration let lapse. Uh, where will students first be on vouchers, tax credits, scholarships, and the competition they provide? The second question is, where do you sign up for Student First? So you go to studentsfirst.org, uh, and um, that's very clear how you become a member and a supporter. Um, the, the voucher issue, I think, is, a, is another one that's a sort of great example because this is an issue where, uh, I mean, partisanship is at play in a huge way. I mean, Democrats and Republicans fight about vouchers all of the time, and I, I am a Democrat. So when I came out in favor of the voucher program, people went nuts, and they said, but you not only are Democrats, so should be against it, but you also have the most to lose from the voucher program because if you let the kids have the vouchers, then you'll have fewer students, and then your 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 you know your school district dwindles. And I always said, but my job is not to maintain market share. My job is to make sure that every kid in the city is getting a great education. I'm agnostic as to where that happens. And you know, I had 
far too many situations where I would meet a, a family, a parent who lived in Anacostia in Ward 8, which is the lowest income port, part of town, who would come to me and say, okay, my neighborhood school, I did all of the research on it, it is not good enough for my child. So I entered the out of boundary lottery and, and I, I, I tried to get a spot at one of the you know, 10 great schools in the city. I didn't get a spot in any of those. So what am I supposed to do now? And I didn't have a space in a school that I would send, you know, feel comfortable sending my own children to. So who am I to deny that family a $7,500 voucher to get a spot in a you know, Catholic school that, that their kid is going to be much better off in? Right? I, I, I can't. I, I can't, when you're looking at it from the kid's perspective, I get it from the system perspective, but if you look at it from the kid's perspective, it's very hard to deny that child and that family that opportunity. And mind you, $7,500 is less per student than what we were spending per child. So again, from the kid's perspective, it just didn't make any sense to me to say, and, I, and I, even though I get the whole party politics, but that's where I feel like we have to push the politics aside for a moment. We have to have an agenda that is about children, and we have to make our decisions based on what is in the best interest of individual children. Please join me in thanking our 2011 Urban Innovator Award winner, Michelle Reed. I think it is clear how fortunate we are to believe in the power of ideas. Supply the common sense and the fresh thinking to the Manhattan Institute.